But the point is not that capitalism is bad or evil. Anything but. It's a legitimate expression and development of human freedom. But it develops, this freedom develops through self-contradictory developments. Freedom yeah, even, turns even, into unfreedom. What exactly is libertarian communism? Because I, I call myself a libertarian communist, ma mainly as a provocation. Um, first, because I ultimately believe in human freedom, the possibility of it, in terms of that we will be able to make choices not on pain of starvation. That, <laughs> that this, is, this is the kind of future that I think is possible, that capitalism lays the foundation for, but doesn't give us the ability to. So capitalism makes all these promises, and then it's like, oh, well, you can't have that. And then again, with this whole idea of critique, people are like, you're swindled by the American dream. Yeah. The point isn't that you're swindled by the American dream, so you should just give up. The point is, why can't it deliver? You know it can deliver. You see it all over the place. It's in the shops. It's yeah. in the food that gets burned and, and thrown into dumpsters. <laughs> you know, that's the question is, why can't I have that? Why are you dangling it in front of me and then destroying it? It's about sort of uh, trying to, to grasp hold of the, these possibilities. And that's why I call myself a libertarian. And I believe in communism because I think communism is the only thing that can produce that. So I actually find myself agreeing quite a lot with libertarians, yeah. which confuses people. It's just so we disagree on who can deliver the goods. I don't think capitalism can deliver the goods. It can. Mm. <laughs> but what do you understand by libertarian communism? Yeah. Um, you know, it's not really a term I've used for myself. Um, but I'm not opposed to it as long as I'm able to clarify what, what it might mean. Yeah, because I said it's a provocation also because it confuses people. Yeah. But also, yeah. communist, to call yourself a communist, going back to the German ideology, means that you are linking to a movement of communism mm -hmm. that is communism, and that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not, it, yeah, it can only be a provocation. It, it, no, sure, and I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not opposed to it. I think Ralph, I think Ralph Leonard, um, Use the term in in a an essay or an article he wrote for sublation. Egoism: The Basis for Communism by Ralph Leonard, May eighteenth, twenty twenty three. Many leftists have an allergy to anything that reeks of individualism. Talk of the individual and his sovereignty for them is the domain of acolytes of Ayn Rand and the ideologues of neoliberalism, while good leftists religiously revere the common good, social welfare, and the collective. In quotidian discourse, it is simply assumed that capitalism equals individualism, while communism equals collectivism. I think it's about time these prejudices were revisited. It mustn't be forgotten that the original critique of individualism came from the conservative reaction to the French Revolution. The first use of the term individualism was arguably by Joseph de Maistre as a term of abuse. He and others, such as Edmund Burke, charged individualism and the Enlightenment philosophy it undergirded with weakening the foundations of the social order and dissolving traditional bonds based on religion, rank, and custom in favor of an atomizing and leveling doctrine of individual natural rights, which freed each individual to focus on his egoistic desires over his duty to the community. For many socialist capitalist society is to be condemned, not just for its exploitation of the working class by the bourgeoisie, but for the individualistic character of social relationships it produces, whether it's the rational pursuit of self-interest or the reinforcement of competitive, acquisitive, and possessive attitudes. There is, of course, some convergence with the conservative critique of individualism, but most socialists don't seek to revive traditional civilization, but to create a future utopia, in common imagination, in which cooperative, socially-minded, non-acquisitive individuals share in the common task of producing and distributing goods to meet social needs at a more equitable level. Even Marx, according to a ubiquitous stereotype promulgated by critics and epigones alike, was just another socialist thinker who emphasized the social over the individual. Yet this opposition between the individual and the social would have made no sense to Marx. Marx was one of the great philosophers of freedom precisely because he understood the intrinsic relationship between individual and social freedom. The freedom of the individual, the freedom to realize his almost boundless potential, is the standard against which a society ought to be judged. As much as anything else, Marx's critique of capitalism was motivated by the fact that capitalist society had failed the individual. He could not truly flourish so long as he labored under the dictatorship of capital. It's an elementary point. 
If the individual isn't free, then society is in no sense free too. Calling oneself a libertarian communist, an individualist communist, or an egoist communist to most is an oxymoron, but I like to claim those labels for myself because they upend the stale stereotype of the deluded, selfless, do-gooder communist. In other words, I am a communist because I am an individualist. To go further, I am a communist because I am a greedy motherfucker. I don't aspire to own the means of production just to better my quality of life. I want to own the means because I want to be the owner. I want to own of the entire wealth and culture of society. I want the world to be my property. I want it all. I don't want my life determined by my class position, or my race, or what piece of territory I was born on. To give individuals the power and freedom to shape their fate, and to become the co-owners of society, class must be transcended. Class must be transcended altogether. Egoism is the basis for communism. Indeed, it's the only rational basis for communism. What will drive the working class to struggle for communism isn't some vapid, vague belief in justice or maudlin sentimentality, but the desire for their own self-enjoyment and self-actualization. Communism will be brought about through the selfishness, greed, and lust for wealth that capitalism is unable to satiate. When Oswald Spengler condemned Marxism as the capitalism of the lower classes, he was more right than he knew. Moreover, communism seeks to create a world where people really relate to each other as unique individuals without the mediation of a state, or as avatars of race, nation, ethnicity, tribe, culture, or any other spook you can conjure. The tragedy of history is that for so long the freedom of some depended on the enslavement and exploitation of the rest. What is unprecedented about the modern epoch is the concrete potential for universal freedom, an Athens without slaves or masters. When we speak of collective freedom or the freedom of society, we speak of the freedom of each individual that constitutes society, because we recognize that society would be nothing without the creative powers of the individuals who compose it. Communism would entail a sociality that doesn't obliterate the individualism of bourgeois society, but build upon it and enrich it. Truly sovereign, unique selves can only flourish under communism. Communism is the apotheosis of individualism. The great thing about communism, as Oscar Wilde pointed out, is that the individual will be liberated from the sordid necessity of living for others. I want to go more in depth into the notion of libertarian communism, not just in this conversation, but just generally throughout these these podcasts and throughout my kind of communications, first of all, because every now and then I come across a libertarian communism, I guess. <laughs> but also because, you know, if you look around for videos, you can see that there, there are all these videos on libertarian socialism. And there are lots of waffle about libertarian socialism. And it's like, oh, well, why do you want what's libertarian socialism oh we'll be more democratic and and we'll live together better we'll have this we'll have that and it's always this sort of like dreaming up of another world because as though you've got an option you can have this world as it is forever and ever or you can have this one which i think would be better it's not how it works yeah it's this it's a process of becoming and the point is to understand what is becoming <laughs> because it could we could be in the pro you know we are you know, capitalism is becoming something else. And that something else could be horrific. And that something else could be, we could bring to fruition the pro it's 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 sort of latent promises of you know socialized production. That's happening under capitalism. Capitalism socializes production. <laughs> the basic principles underlying the free market as Adam Smith taught them to his students in this university, are really very simple. Look at this lead pencil. There's not a single person in the world who could make this pencil. Remarkable statement? Not at all. The wood from which it's made, for all I know, comes from a tree that was cut down in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, it took a saw. To make the saw, it took steel. To make the steel, it took iron ore. This black center, we call it lead, but it's really graphite, compressed graphite. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I think it comes from some mines in South America. This red top up here, the eraser, bit of rubber, probably comes from Malaya, where the rubber tree isn't even native. It was imported from South America by some businessmen with the help of the British government. This brass ferrule, 
I haven't the slightest idea where it came from, or the yellow paint, or the paint that made the black lines, or the glue that holds it together. Literally thousands of people cooperated to make this pencil. People who don't speak the same language, who practice different religions, who might hate one another if they ever met. When you go down to the store and buy this pencil, you are in effect trading a few minutes of your time for a few seconds of the time of all those thousands of people. What brought them together and induced them to cooperate to make this pencil? There was no commissar sending out offices from, sending out orders from some central office. It was a magic of the price system, the impersonal operation of prices that brought them together and got them to cooperate to make this pencil so that you could have it for a trifling sum. That is why the operation of the free market is so essential, not only to promote productive efficiency, but even more to foster harmony and peace among the peoples of the world. Let them remember, you know, global warming might end the planet in 100 or 200 years time. Nuclear war and war with Russia could end the planet tomorrow. Iran now issuing a threat against the U.S., saying that it will, quote, decisively respond to any American attack on the Islamic Republic. It's already a precarious situation in the Middle East. Nobody needs to be told that again. Uh, but this is a significant escalation. Donald Trump, meanwhile, says we're on the brink of World War III. Um, but there's this idea of, like, um, that we have these options. And I think the purpose of why Marxism is so important to try to understand is that it tries to use the forces of reason <laughs> to correctly grasp exactly what processes are at play so that we can control them instead of being controlled by them. Mm. And at the moment, we are being controlled by them. Libertarian communism. I, it's an, a very interesting formulation, and uh, I think it, it's appropriate in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I, I the, my only reticence is that I'm not a big, <laughs> I don't want to sound like one of these, you know, when we were younger, I think this is maybe not, this is not common anymore, but when we were younger, there was this thing like, oh, I don't label myself. You know, I don't like labels. Yeah. Now people are absolutely obsessed with labels, but, um, you know, I don't want to come off like that, but, uh, you know, I, I prefer more simple. I like to just say Marxist, um, or maybe Leninist or, or even Trotskyist at times, um, when it won't put people off. Um, but you know, whatever it's, it's, you know, I, I think it's definitely an appropriate, um, appellation in a lot of ways because I mean, frankly, I've, so since I've been kind of using, uh, Twitter more, um, I have found it very worthwhile engaging with a lot of libertarians on there. I, I find it uh, salutary engaging with libertarians because there is this very, very deeply ingrained kind of default statism in the minds of most people, not just leftists, but leftists in, as well, that people just can't think about things in any other way than by taking the existence of this kind of authoritarian bureaucratic state, the capitalist state, for granted, the Bonapartist state, if you will, for granted. Um, it's just, it's, it's not even like, is it good or bad? It's just part of reality. Like, there's not even any way of contesting it. And when people think of themselves as revolutionaries, like, you know, Marxist, revolutionary socialists, revolutionary communists, whatever, the way they think about that is, we want a state like that, you know, <laughs> either we want to take over this state, like the, you know, uh, democratic socialists or social Democrats or what, what have you, like they want to take over the state or I mean the better ones, they want to take it over the, a lot of them don't even want that. They just want the Democrats to do what, what they say, or at least do a little bit more of what they say, mm -hmm. which is just pathetic. Um, sorry, but it's pathetic. Um, and then you have like the more hardcore, you know, um, revolutionary Marxists or socialists or what have you, uh, who want their own state, you know, to impose what they want 
on yeah. society, which is not at all, at, at all, not at all what Marxism is about. <laughs> now, now Engels does famously write against the anarchists um, who, you know, characterize themselves as anti-authoritarian, right? Um, he famously says against them in the piece called On Authority that, you know, these gentlemen are deluding themselves because a revolution is the most authoritarian thing imaginable. It's literally imposing upon others with, uh, you know, with, with um, gunpowder and cannons, you know, <laughs> You know, it's literally, it's, it is literally authoritarian in that sense, of course. It's, but it's not, it's not authoritarian in the sense of like embracing that. The fact of the matter is you have to meet force with force. I mean, look at what we're fighting here. Like if you want to overthrow these monstrous machines of oppression that are called states, these bureaucratic, you know, um, machines and their, and their repressive forces, uh, you know, the repressive forces they command, how are you going to do that without having the ability to meet their force with a comparable force? You can't. It's absurd. You know, that's why anarchism is not realistic. It just doesn't make sense. You know, the, the best trends in anarchism, in a, in a way, uh, maybe the worst in a, in a different way, um, recognize the need for like a, a violent insurrection. Not, again, not as like a positive good, but just if you want to overthrow this, you're going to face violent suppression and you're going to have to meet that violence with violence. It's just reality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but then the question is, as I was saying earlier, what comes after that, right? Yeah. Are you just going to pretend like there's nobody with that capacity to repress people anymore? No. That's yeah, I think the most radical are kind of fetishize violence in that sense. They're not thinking about like, right. well, that's, are, are you being real here about like the kind of that's violence what you're it's, talking about? It's not like yeah. you're just going to go out lone wolfish or whatever. It's you to have, generate it to that point, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, the, 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 you know, capitalism itself organizes the working class into into armies right right, it, right. and and it, it but it takes an extraordinary amount of organization even to be able to like turn that around to your own purposes it's 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 like it's a real quite quite serious thing yeah. and, <laughs> not you like know, you and your bedroom are going to plot this out <laughs> right and you're not going to do it as you know guerrilla warriors in 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 the backwoods or something um whether that's like a white right-wing militia group or like a maoist sect or something you know mm -hmm. um but you know, whatever. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I don't. I don't really feel the need to like argue against that. It's just not. It's not serious. It's never going to go anywhere. You know, um, mm -hmm. the most it might lead to like terrorism, which is yeah. all that's going to do is going to bring down the repressive force of the state. You know, Marx and Engels had this. They were very clear that the forces of the proletarian revolution need to restrain the masses as best they can. Now, that doesn't mean acting as like a conservative force in the sense of like putting down the initiative of the working class. But, and the working class, working class people out of their, their anguish at the conditions in which they exist and their struggle against them are, of course, going to be moved at times to do rash and, and um, you, know, uh, you know, to make rash judgments and to simply act without considering the consequences. And you need to be able to, to make of that the best that you can because the whole point of marxism is that the working class the immense majority of people need to be the ones taking the initiative politically mm -hmm. it's not about these intellectuals with these bright ideas elevating themselves to power through you know uh by riling people up or something that's not what it's about it's about the working class doing it the point being that marx and engels did not think insurrection in that sense will get you anywhere and all it's going to do all things like riots or uh you know what have you like uh, terrorism these sorts of things all that's going to do is bring down the state against you and it's going to give them an excuse to destroy yeah. the movement as you know, do whatever they can to repress the movement it's going to give them it's not just going to give them an excuse in the sense that like they need an excuse it's going to give them an excuse in the sense that you're going to turn most of the people in society against you. Mm -hmm. And those people, will, when they see the state coming after you, they'll say, well, they kind of were asking for it. You know, that's what's going to happen. So why would you bring that on yourselves? That's absurd. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is get to the point where our army 
is so overwhelmingly large that there's no chance of repressing. That's the goal. So that, that, and you know, this is, I mean, basically Marx and Engels said, these people that want to like start riots or engage in terrorism, even if they're not police agents, you know, agent provocateurs, <laughs> they might as well be. And there yeah. were, of course, lots of agent provocateurs and, and other police spies in, in the movement back in those days. One of the sort of trends that I have noticed uh, as well, and just like to the extent that there is a left, but that's sort of like online left, is this anti-liberalism, the sort of like anti-liberalism. Mm -hmm. and, and what they don't realize, I, I always think people need to read more about the young Hegelians, because if you read more about the young Hegelians, you can really get at the essence of what Marx, you know, that this is the sort of like the seeds that eventually that he grew out of, right? which was like a powerfully liberal, powerfully liberal in the sense of enlightenment liberal force. They even called themselves uh, encyclopedists. You know, they saw themselves as carrying the torch of the French Revolution. Um, and so um, I, I find the kind of trend of anti-liberalism very concerning. And I think it often goes hand in hand with a kind of statism, because when I talk about neoliberalism, people get really confused. And what I, I think a better name for it would be post-liberalism in the sense that it is the destruction of the liberal project. It signifies its end. That the, it is a complete and total evacuation of the belief in the Enlightenment subject that was, one, that was once being slowly democratized. Obviously, the Enlightenment subject was just like, you know, in, you know white man or whatever. But over time, more and more people want it in. Yeah. I, too, am a man. I, too, am a man. I deserve that um, the, the, to stand on the sort of pedestal of humanity. Right. And now it's like, no, fuck, nobody's that. But the point I would really emphasize is there is a highly participatory, representative, liberal and democratic political culture in late colonial and revolutionary and Republican, early Republican America. If you read history as you should going forward, not going backward by the standards of our time. And the other reason why I emphasize the same and so strongly is because the fight back presentation suggests that, oh, well, we can see that the American Revolution didn't really um, intend any of these ideals of liberty, equality, et cetera, because slavery remained in place and the status of women remained the same. The point there is, of course, the American Revolution did not eliminate slavery to core and the American Revolution did not transform the status of women. But it's the process by which those things became systematically questioned in society. The American Revolution, revolutionary America, colonial America didn't invent slavery, transatlantic slavery or slavery throughout world history. It didn't invent the secondary status of women in society. That dates back to settled agriculture and the rise of civilization. Rather, it began the process because of the rights it enunciated, because of the defense it offered in claims of its revolutionary activities, um, because of the natural rights, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that it unfolded, um, it essentially began the questioning of those institutions. So it's during the American revolutionary experience itself that many leading members of the colonial American resistance movement and the founding fathers systematically questioned slavery and they set up manumission and abolition societies all the way from New Jersey and Pennsylvania through to New Hampshire. And basically by 1800, slavery is eliminated in the Northern colonies, the, the, the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New England, right? Completely eliminated. And also at a federal level, they think they've set up the limitation of the expansion of plantation slavery from the South beyond those borders. And it's eventual gradual elimination over time, certainly over decades. No, the reason that I think it goes hand in hand with um, this kind of statism is that the state itself is also post-liberal in the sense that it has given up on that subject and had to, yeah. had to destroy that subject long ago, long ago. You needed the this, this subject, you needed to kind of fell feudalism to the ground and now it's outlived its capacity because that subject is going to want more, right? They're going to want to make good on the promises of the revolution. You can't have that. Right. And so... The, the 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 modern state is is engaged in this sort of psychological warfare of this destruction of democracy and so on. Uh, and I think people, the the quote unquote left, 
has bought into that by being so anti-liberal, so unreflectively anti-liberal and sort of critiquing the Enlightenment without the productive side of that critique, just sort of, oh, you know, 1789 is abolished kind of thing. Right. <laughs> no. and, and, and I think, yeah, so I think this sort of, when people miss out that liberal core, which now is expressed in libertarian mm -hmm. communism, um, they miss out on that the core, which is the revolutionary subject, right. and they right. are engaging in that destruction. And this puts them hand in hand with the bureaucratic state, the state that wants to also destroy that. And so they find me, someone like me, to be very, very fucking confusing. Yeah, I'm still I'm trying so hard to fight against that state and its destruction of the people. And mm -hmm. I, ideally, ideally, this ideal destruction of of the human ability for reason to self govern and therefore to self-emancipate. So I think that's also like the core of this, of putting, of tacking on that libertarian thing yeah. as a kind of moniker. I think it goes back to the liberal, the fundamentally liberal roots of Marxism. Because the problem with liberalism isn't that, isn't liberalism it, itself, it's that it, it, first of all, it can't make good on that. And second, therefore it destroys and suppresses the, the impulse for freedom. That's what fascism is. Fascism is, is a culmination of liberalism, but in the sense of liberalism turning back on, on itself and destroying itself. The Apprentice's Sorcerer by Ishelanda. Yet liberalism from the point of view guiding this study is a complex of concepts and institutions developed at a specific historical period to answer concrete needs. And hence, we should allow for the possibility of changes in liberalism if changing circumstances and altered needs are to be met and fulfilled. I contend that fascism became feasible because of the profound difficulties of liberalism in its classical form to cope with the challenge represented by that many-sided phenomenon to which we now refer as mass society. Liberalism, like the sorcerer's apprentice in the famous poem, Story, called into existence forces immensely useful at first, but which it subsequently could not control. Those unruly and uncannily multiplying mops the modern workers, which refused to accept their role as mere tools in the production process and were gaining lives and wills of their own. So the liberal apprentice conjures a sorcerer too, in order to re-establish order, re-transform the animated brooms into plain wood. Fascism, in spite of words and gestures, came not really to do battle with liberalism, but primarily as an ally, albeit a bullying, patronizing one, offering much-needed succor and it offered its services at a price. The price was for liberalism to change, to modify its behavior, even to change its name, and indeed sometimes to call itself socialism. While liberalism, for its part in some exemplary cases, thought the price worth paying, thought the transformation worth going through, not least because fascism signified a project of supposed restoring to health and restructuring, to use a trendy term, with which liberalism itself had a lot to do in devising and developing, in order to salvage the vessel of capitalism, economic liberals were quite often ready and willing to throw overboard the excess baggage of liberal political institutions and ideals. This is what I refer to as the momentous liberal split, whereby economic liberalism and political liberalism began drifting apart to the point of finding themselves on opposite sides of the socioeconomic divide. One be clear that I'm not trying to put out some like new right. way of thinking about things. I'm just trying to get back to basics in terms of what did Marx and Engels actually think and do and, and what did they inspire their followers to do? Um, so in that sense, but in that sense, Marx and Engels were 100% classical liberals in the sense that for, oh, so first of all, what do we mean by classical liberal or libertarian? You know, it's like a new kind of coinage. You know, the term libertarian is a coinage um, to basically revive the ideas of classical liberalism in a, in a period in which liberal had essentially become synonymous with statism. <laughs> you know, so exactly. it's like, which is obviously talking about contradiction, right? Like that's literally the opposite of what liberal used to mean. So um, libertarian is like this way of trying to get back at that original. And you know, people also call themselves classical liberals as well. Marx and Engels were 100% classical liberals in that sense. Now, they wouldn't have used those terms. And the reason they wouldn't have used those terms is because the liberals were a distinct political current at the time. 
that mm -hmm. stood for certain things that were in continuity with the classical liberal tradition, but were already departing from it in fundamental ways mm -hmm. because they couldn't come to grips with the changes that were happening in the society that was based upon these liberal principles, or to put it in maybe the more Marxist way, um, the society upon which those liberal ideas were based, right, Re or reflections, the society that of which those ideas were were um, ideological reflections. Um, so, but but Marx and Engels were fundamentally classical liberal, liberals in the sense that they were committed to the project of bourgeois revolution. They just thought since the industrial revolution, the bourgeois horizon of these revolutions is itself a limitation to their further advancing. But that doesn't mean that you want to be anti-liberal or anti-bourgeois, not at all. The point is rather that liberalism itself is coming up against limits of the, the, the form of society that gave birth to it, right? The, the kind of social relations of which these ideas, these principles are reflections. Uh, you know, intellectual clarifications of what's going on in society. Um, the point basically being that, like, it's not that the ideas are inherently wrong. It's that the underlying form of society is developing beyond the form it took that expressed itself in those ideas. It's not developing beyond them in the sense that it is fundamentally breaking with them. Uh, it is in a way, but it, in another way, it's not. It's fulfilling them. Right, it's both fulfilling these ideas and negating them. It's both overcoming these ideas and completing them. That's that's sort of the idea. Is that like there was an end goal that was already in a way implicitly there in the original bourgeois revolutions, but they, the people involved in it, they couldn't have possibly understood that at the time. They had a limited horizon, and that's not any fault of theirs. I think there's a, a a, a quote by, I think it's Goethe, it might be an apocryphal quote, but I, I like it, um, which is uh, a man's um, faults are the, a man's faults are like, a man's faults are the limitations of his time, but his virtues are his own, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can fault, you know, um, you can fault, uh, you know, say Thomas Jefferson for owning slaves. But it's not like he decided, I want to own slaves and like <laughs> and enslaved people. Slavery was a fundamental part of society at the time. And he was against it. But you can't just will it away. You know, that, that, that could, you know, I mean, I don't want to get into that. That's a whole other discussion. But the point basically, <laughs> the significance of someone like Jefferson is not that he owned slaves. There were lots of slave owners. There are slave owners throughout human history. I mean, human history is the history of slavery. And getting back to the, the libertarian point, here's a libertarian quote from Marx for you. The existence of the sweat of the state, the existence of the state is inseparable from the in existence of slavery. That's Marx. Marx is not a statist. Marx is a revolutionary. He's trying to overthrow the state and end slavery. That's his goal. Okay. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand me. Visit patreon.com slash Ashley A. Frawley for part two.